The subject of today's session is Abraham. And while we will be focusing in particular today on Genesis chapters 18 and 19, I think it's instructive for us to begin by recalling some matters that we discussed at the end when we spoke of Noah. In particular, what we saw in the text, the words of the Torah, with respect to Noah and with respect to Abraham and the comparison between them. I remind you that in the Hebrew, we encountered a relatively rare construction that is the reflexive hit halech. Maybe we could better translate that as walking oneself. But in any case, the implication as we saw it in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, when we read the praise of Noah, is in the Hebrew, et ha'elohim hitalech noach, in translation, Noah walked with God. The self-same rare verb construction, hitalech, we find applied to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Here it is not merely a description, it is an imperative. It is God saying to Abraham, in the Hebrew it's hitalech lefanai, in translation, you walk before me. And of course, inevitably, we can't help but note the contrast between Noah walking with God, but that means, in some sense, the initiative is coming from God. God holds Noah by the hand. Certainly, an exalted level. But Abraham goes first. Walk before me. We'll consider in what follows what that teaches us with respect to the character of Abraham as it emerges, again in particular, in chapters 18 and 19. But before we entirely leave chapter 17 and move on to chapter 18, we should note something very basic and actually very crucial in understanding what chapter 17 is telling us about Abraham. First, we consider what follows immediately after this divine command to walk before me, that is from verse two and on, the covenant that God makes with Abraham. And it is a covenant that makes our father Abraham the father of us all. As we read in verses four and five, God says, your name shall be Abraham, because you shall be a father of a multitude of nations. And of course, it is in that context that we read at the end of the chapter of how Abraham is summoned as a sign of this covenant to undergo circumcision. And maybe on the most immediate plane, the reason that that realization with respect to the end of the chapter is so imperative is because now as we embarked upon chapter 18, we consider the answer to the first most immediate problem that we encounter in chapter 18, verse 1, which reads, And God appeared unto him by the turbans of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And of course, what's obviously striking, this is the first verse of the chapter, is Who's him? Well, because we already took a look at the end of chapter 17, we realize that the subject in these final verses of chapter 17 is continuously Abraham, in the self same day, was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael's son, and all the men of his 
house, whose house? Abraham's house. We're circumcised with him, with Abraham. So of course we know very well that in verse one, God appeared unto him, refers to Abraham. It is striking, however, that Abraham isn't named. Now, I should point out, as we've discussed in the past, the division of nearly all the books of the Bible, really all the books of the Bible, with the exception of the Psalms and the chapters of Lamentations, the division into chapters is very late and not authoritative. But at the same time, the beginning of a new story in chapter 18 really is pretty much inescapable. And besides chapter 18 being a new chapter, indeed in the traditional division of the five books of Moses into the Torah portions that we read on the Sabbaths over the course of the year, chapter 18 is the beginning of a new portion, not just a new chapter. So it's interesting. We're starting a new story. Imrab isn't named, just understood. We'll consider in what follows what that may imply with respect to verse 1. But before we return to that issue, there's a more basic and more glaring difficulty. The chapter 18, verses 1, and what follow, force us to consider. Let's read verse 1 again. And God appeared unto him by the terebinths of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. God appeared to him. Well, another way of saying that is divine revelation. This is prophecy. God is revealed to Abraham. And the glaring problem is, when we read of God appearing to someone, revealing himself to someone, when we read about a prophecy, well, of course, we expect that immediately afterward, we'll read the content of the prophecy. So what was God conveying? And we took a look at verse two, and verse two, seems to be completely unrelated to verse 1. We never get to the content of the prophecy. We're left dangling here. God appeared unto him. What did he say? In verse 2, and he, Abraham, lifted up his eyes and saw, and lo, three men stood over against him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed down to the earth. And what happened to God? What happened to the prophecy? What happened to the revelation? We don't know. So, returning then to verse 1, the principal difficulty that it forces us to address is, to what are we to connect it? It seems just dangling in the void without our ever getting any information as to what this appearance of God, what this revelation, what this prophecy, indicated. So, of course, inevitably, the only way to solve a problem with a verse that seems to be dangling alone and needs to be connected to something is to connect it either to the verses that come after it or to the verses that come before it. Now, you might be expecting me to give you some simple, straightforward answer to this question and say, Well, we're going to have to connect chapter 18, verse 1, to the verses that come after it, or we have to connect verse 1 to the end of chapter 17 that came before it. But you probably aren't really expecting me at this point to give you a simple, straightforward answer, are you? Because, of course, the Word of God is inexhaustible. There are so many layers, so many levels. And they all have something to teach us. And indeed, the truth is, we don't have only one right answer to this question. And among Bible scholars, 
there are indeed advanced alternative interpretations, either to connect chapter 18, verse 1, to the verses that come after it, or to connect it to the verses that come before it. And inevitably then, we're going to need to consider both possibilities, which I must concede leads me to a little bit of a warning apology at the outset. This session is going to be a little bit complex because we're going to need to encompass in our minds simultaneously more than one possibility of what the Word of God is teaching us. Just consider, as we've noted on many occasions, the importance of being able to connect with the original. Because a translation necessarily will only follow one course. A translation can never encompass all of the manifold possibilities of the original. But that's exactly what we need to do. So it's on that note, then, that we begin possibility number one. Knowing full well that before this session is up, we're going to need to consider possibility number two as well. Possibility number one, the order here is a little bit arbitrary, but the first of the alternatives that I'd like to discuss is that we, in fact, do connect chapter 18, verse 1, with the verses that come afterward. To express this in terms of the common contemporary English punctuation, in this possibility, verse 1 shouldn't end as it does here with a semicolon or with a period. It should end with a colon. That is, verse 1 then serves as a general statement. God appeared unto him, unto Abraham. What was the content of that appearance? What was the content of that prophecy? Well, the content of that prophecy is everything that we're going to read from verse 2 and on. When we read that Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw, and lo, three men stood over against him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed down to the earth. According to this possibility, what we're reading is the content of the prophecy that it was introduced in verse 1 when God appeared to Abraham. Now, if you ask prophecy, what prophecy? This isn't prophecy. This is just seeing three men walking down the road. Ah, uh, yes, but recall that by the end of the story, we will indeed know these are not ordinary men. That is, when we get to verses 9 and 10, and we read that these strangers say to Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? Interesting. They know his wife's name. And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, now you'll note, there's an ambiguity here that I express in the brackets. The Hebrew, of course, doesn't have capital letters. In the Hebrew, we simply read at the beginning of verse 10, Vayomer, and he said, where he doesn't have an explicit antecedent. Could be he, God, said. Could also be he, this strange man, said. But in either alternative, what's being said here clearly are words of prophecy. I will certainly return unto you when the season comes round. And lo, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Extraordinary miracle. A prophecy telling a couple, the husband, 99 years old. The wife, a young girl of only 89, that next year they're going to have a child. Well, there's a prophecy here. Maybe this whole story is part of the prophecy. Everything we're reading here is all 
underneath that title of God appeared unto him. And everything that we're reading is a description of Abraham's prophetic vision. Maybe a joint vision of Abraham and Sarah, because after all, they're both playing roles in this story. But then something that's taking place either in Abraham's mind or in Abraham's and Sarah's mind, but not as anything that's taking place in the outside world, because it's all a prophetic vision. Now, there are several great difficulties that we need to consider in this interpretation. But maybe the most glaring of all is, this is all happening in a prophetic vision? It sure seems, when we read the story, that it's happening as an external reality, as an actual event. And if you're telling me that chapter 18, in, in fact, is not an external reality, it's all happening in the prophetic vision of Abraham or the prophetic visions of Abraham and Sarah, then when does it end? Is the rest of the Torah all part of that prophetic vision of Abraham and Sarah? A very glaring question that needs to be answered. In fact, fascinatingly, there is a very straightforward way of answering this question. That is, we know after all that prophetic visions and dreams often take place when one is asleep. Well, here we could say the prophetic vision ends when we read that Abraham got up. And indeed, we have a verse in which we read about Abraham getting up. In chapter 19, verse 27, and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he had stood before God. So tantalizing possibility, maybe everything up until chapter 19, verse 27, from that initial statement in chapter 18, verse 1, that God appeared to Abraham, maybe all of that is a description of what's taking place in Abraham's prophetic vision. A tantalizing possibility. What is all the more tantalizing about it is if we take this possibility to its inevitable conclusion, it actually helps to answer some otherwise glaring questions in chapter 19. Because when you consider what takes place, in particular, let's look at verses 23 and on in chapter 19. There seems to be an awful lot of repetition. From verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot came unto Tsar. Then God caused to rain upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from God out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. So we read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah being overturned and the story of Lot being saved. But we read the exact same story, so it appears, in verses 28 and in particular 29. Taking it from verse 28, and he looked out toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the land went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. But wait, we already know all of that. Didn't we read all of that in the previous set of verses beginning in verse 23? So why the repetition? And upon further reflection here, we can answer that question. Because if indeed everything from chapter 18, verse 1, through chapter 19, verse 27, is happening in Abraham's prophetic vision, then there are some additional, very vexing questions that arise. Well, 
if the whole story only happened in Abraham's vision, were Sodom and Gomorrah ever overturned? Maybe that also only took place in Abraham's vision. And if they were overturned, did Lot ever make it out? After all, Lot's being taken out of the cities also. Until verse 27 is only being described as having taken place in Abraham's prophetic vision. So what actually happened? And consider at this point that we can derive the answer precisely from what we're reading here in the text. True, verses 23 through 25 are describing Lot's being saved and the cities being overthrown in Abraham's prophetic vision, which ends in verse 27 when Abraham gets up. Abraham, in verse 27, gets up early in the morning after having experienced a terrifying prophetic vision, a vision in which he saw these cities overthrown and destroyed. So immediately, first thing, he looked out toward Sodom and Gomorrah and beheld, and lo, smoke of the land went up as the smoke of a furnace. It really happened. It's not repetitious at all. Until now, when we read in verse 25 over of the overthrowing of Sodom and Gomorrah, we were reading the description of what Abraham saw in his vision. Verse 28, it's for real. He sees the cities were overthrown. The smoke of the land went up as the smoke of a furnace. And as for the following question, so what happened to Lot? We read in verse 29, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. So yes, in the real world, Lot and his daughters, in fact, got out in time. So, considering what we've seen thus far, we have this alternative of understanding chapter 18, verse 1, as a title. Everything from chapter 18, verse 2, and through chapter 19, verse 26, just before Abraham gets up, is what Abraham is seeing in his prophetic vision. And while everything we had read in that interval was part of the vision, the cities were overthrown, as we read in verses 28 and 29. And Lot and his daughters were saved, as we read in verse 29. But that, nevertheless, raises a host of additional questions. So we're prepared to grant that Lot was saved, but how was he saved? That is, after all, recall what we read in the first part of chapter 19. In the first part of chapter 19, we read, beginning in verse 1, the two angels came to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot saw them and rose up to meet them, and he fell down upon his face to the earth, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn aside, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall arise up early and go on your way. They didn't want to accept the invitation, but in verse 3, he urged them greatly, and so they turned into him, and he made them a feast. Well, maybe it wasn't such a great feast. He baked unleavened bread for them, and they did eat. Now remember, in this possibility, all of this is taking place exclusively in Abraham's prophetic vision. What does Lot know of all this? Probably nothing. What is 
still more startling and confusing is what happens next? If the angels coming to Sodom is taking place in Abraham's prophetic vision, then what we read in the following verses about the people of Sodom becomes even more perplexing. Well, how did they know about these angels? In verse 4, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both young and old, all the people from every quarter, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men that came into you this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. How did they know about any men coming to visit? They were angels. And it was only in Abraham's prophetic vision. And the continuation, and Lot went out unto them to the door and shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, my brethren, do not so wickedly. The whole story of the interplay between Lot and the people of Sodom, that's all taking place in the prophetic vision. And even more so, after all that, when we read in verses 15 and 16, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters that are here, lest you be swept away in the iniquity of the city. But he lingered, and the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, God being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. But all of this, again, is what Abraham is seeing in his prophetic vision. So how did Lot end up out of Sodom? We return again to the continuation of the chapter. Remember, this is what we read much later on in verse 29, after Abraham got up. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Isn't that, after all, what we read in verses 15, 16, and on? Again, in this possibility, we say what we read up until we got to verse 27 was Abraham's prophetic vision. The people of Sodom certainly knew nothing about this. And Lot himself may not have known anything about this. But God, in fact, sent Lot out of the city, not only in Abraham's prophetic vision. He sent him out. Maybe Lot had some premonition. It's time to get out of town. He may not have even known that he was being guided by the hand of God. He might have been completely oblivious to the angels taking him out of the city. He may have just felt that he was drawn by some subconscious urge. But in fact, God was taking him out of the city. There were angels who took him and his wife and his daughters by the hand to get out of the city. Now, when we consider what this means, how to integrate what is taking place, again, according to this possibility, in Abraham's prophetic vision, on the one hand, with what is taking place in the outside world, on the other. This teaches us a fascinating lesson, a lesson that doesn't only apply to Genesis chapters 18 and 19. In fact, that applies altogether to the profound arena of prophecy and how it operates. Because I suspect that our natural inclination would be to think that, well, you know, prophecy, a vision from God, that means the prophet is completely cut off from everything that's happening in the world around him. And he sees a vision. And the vision is completely divorced from what's happening in what we might otherwise call the real world. And when we consider the implications of this story, 
of what takes place in Abraham's prophetic vision on the one hand, and what takes place in Sodom itself on the other hand, we get an inkling that things may be much more complex than that. Now, we could develop this at very great length, but to try to make things more concrete, I'd like to consider another passage, a passage in Chronicles, that based upon an, an ancient interpretation, an ancient tradition that we have, may be another illustration of the same principle. We have had other occasions to discuss this passage in the second book of Chronicles, in chapter 26. When we read the story of Uzziah, righteous king of Judah, and the story of his tragic undoing, we read of Uzziah in verse 4, he did that which was upright in the eyes of God according to all that his father Amatia had done. And there is indeed, from verse 5 through verse 15, a very lengthy and detailed description of all of his exploits and the extraordinary prosperity, the extraordinary success that God granted him. And then in verse 16, we get to the story that is relevant for our purposes, the story of King Uzziah's downfall. So when he was strong, his heart was lifted up so that he did corruptly and he trespassed against God, his God. For he came into the temple of God to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest came in after him and with him fourscore priests of God that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It pertains not unto you, Uzziah, to burn incense unto God, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron that are consecrated, it pertains to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed, neither shall it be for your honor from God the Lord. We don't know what was motivating Uzziah. Perhaps it could be that he had good intentions. He was so bursting with thanksgiving to God for having been granted such extraordinary prosperity, he felt the need to express his gratitude by bringing incense upon the incense altar. He may have had good intentions, but then, as we know from Dante's Inferno, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. In verse 19, then Uzziah was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy broke forth in his forehead. Leprosy is really a, a poor translation. It is an affliction of the skin, but leprosy is biological. In the Hebrew, it is Hatsarat, a spiritual malaise, a punishment from God. And it breaks forth before the priests in the house of God over the altar of incense. Now, a mere biological disease is not a source of spiritual defilement. Sarat is just imagine the magnitude of the crisis that in the sanctuary, in the holy temple, the king has just become a source of profound spiritual defilement. In verse 20, and Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous. He was smitten with Sarat in his forehead, and they thrust him out quickly from thence. Yea, he himself made haste also to go out because God had stricken him. And Uzziah is stricken with Sarat until his death. 
story of such cataclysm in the temple itself, the sanctuary of the holy temple, the king is smitten with tzarak, becomes a source of spiritual defilement. As cataclysmic, as this story reads in the narrative and chronicles, in our tradition, it was literally far more cataclysmic than only this. Because we have two prophets who describe to us an event, a cataclysm, that took place in the time of Uziah, a massive earthquake. In Amos, the very first verse of chapter one, the words of Amos who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. I feel compelled to share with you that our part of the world suffers a major earthquake on average every 150 to 200 years. There are many earthquakes. Anyone who has lived in Jerusalem as long as I have or longer has experienced tremors. The last major earthquake destroyed the city of Safed less than 180 years ago. But there is an earthquake, there is the earthquake. The earthquake that took place in the days of Uziah, Amos describes as the earthquake. The other prophet who refers to this event is Zechariah. And in Zechariah, the implications with respect to just how severe an earthquake it was may be even greater. In the last chapter of Zechariah, we read of the final battle of the nations against God, fought right here in Jerusalem. Behold, a day of God comes when your spoil will be divided in the midst of you, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And there is a vivid description of the consequences of that battle culminating. Verse 3, why we can be sure this is the final battle. Then shall God go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleft in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. So that there shall be a very great valley and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. We can scarcely even imagine the magnitude of an earthquake that splits a mountain in half. And where the mountain was, a great valley is to be. Verse 5, and you will flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach unto Atzal. Yea, you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uziah, king of Judah. And God, my Lord, shall come and all the holy ones with you. You will flee as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uziah, king of Judah. Same earthquake. And if we ask, what evidence do we have as to the severity of this earthquake? Besides the obvious, the obvious that the cataclysm that takes place in this final battle, when the Mount of Olives splits in two and a great valley exists where the mountain was, besides that obvious indication, just consider when the prophet Zechariah 
is writing these words. Zechariah was a prophet in the second temple period. Over 200 years after this earthquake. And in the interim, there was the Babylonian exile. There wasn't even a continuous presence in the land from the time of the earthquake. And yet, the severity of this earthquake was so indelibly etched in the consciousness of the people that when the prophet Zechariah is talking to his contemporaries and he says, you will flee as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, you, not even being you, your ancestors from over 200 years ago, everyone knew exactly what he meant. Because this earthquake was etched into the national consciousness due to its severity. Why am I sharing all this with you? All we read, after all, in the words of the prophet Amos and the prophet Zechariah, is the earthquake took place in the days of King Uzziah. But there's the additional dimension that we need to consider our tradition regarding this earthquake, and that brings us to Isaiah chapter 6, where in verse 1, we read the introduction to what, as emerges in the continuation of the chapter, is the inaugural prophecy of the prophet Isaiah. We have discussed this at much greater length in the series, The Visions of Isaiah, on this chapter, chapter 6. The introduction to the chapter in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw God sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Isaiah beholds this vision also in the time of King Uzziah. Now he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, in our tradition, someone stricken by Tsarat, the source of defilement that is mistranslated as leprosy, is considered as if dead. That when Isaiah speaks of the year that King Uzziah died, he means when King Uzziah was stricken with Tzarat. And he doesn't just mean the year. He means the time. He means the event. That the event when King Uzziah was stricken by Tsarat, the event, which was when the king trespassed and attempted to bring incense upon the incense altar in the sanctuary in the Holy Temple, that event is precisely what the prophet Isaiah is describing from his prophetic vantage point in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, at that moment, was standing inside the Holy Temple. King Uzziah was being stricken with Tzarath. And simultaneously, ironically, Isaiah was experiencing his inaugural prophecy. And one more component in this equation. At that very moment, the earth was quaking. The response, so to speak, on a cosmic level to King Uzziah's trespass was the earth convulsed in response. And now we consider the words of Isaiah in chapter 6. But we consider it, these words from the vantage point of the trespass of Uzziah and the earthquake. Again, an important lesson as to how a prophetic vision 
can be integrated with what is actually taking place in the external world at the same time. A fascinating exercise for us to consider right now is if we would have been there, standing right next to Isaiah in the sanctuary as this was taking place, just what would we have seen? So again, chapter 6 of Isaiah, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, that is, on the day Uzziah was smitten with Tzarat, I saw God sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Well, obviously, what the prophet Isaiah sees, he sees in prophecy. Certainly, even if we were standing right next to him, we would not behold God. But then when we consider the end of the verse, and his train filled the temple. Now, we can discuss exactly what God's train is in this verse, but the words filled the temple Isaiah is seeing the temple. He's standing inside the holy temple. Well, if we were standing next to him, we would see the temple as well. Just, we wouldn't know anything about seeing God, nor seeing his train, but we would see the temple. Now, obviously, what we read in the next two verses is part of Isaiah's prophecy. Above him stood the seraphim, each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his legs, and with two, he did fly. And one called unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, obviously, these two verses are what Isaiah beholds, what Isaiah hears. We, non-prophets, standing next to him, would neither see nor hear anything. Verse 4. And the posts of the door were moved at the voice of them that called. Now, Isaiah sees the posts of the door, the posts in the holy temple, moving, shaking at the voice of them that called. That is, the prophet sees this shaking as a response to the angels, the seraphim, beholding Uzziah's trespass, calling out, holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the earth is convulsing. What's he describing? The posts are moving. The earth is quaking. And we, standing next to him, we could also see the posts of the door moving, quaking, shaking, the earthquake. Just, we wouldn't know that it was shaking at the voice of them that called. We wouldn't know that the earthquake was the earth convulsing because of Uzziah's trespass and the angels, the seraphim, calling, holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. We would see the earthquake. And as for the end of the verse, and the house was filled with smoke. Perhaps we would have seen that as well. You know, The earth is quaking. The altar shakes. Conceivably, a plume of smoke arose from upon the altar and filled the house with smoke. We might have seen that too. I, of course, don't know. Maybe due to the earthquake, the walls are shaking and plaster is cascading off of the walls and filling the house with dust 
and plaster, and it's as if the house is filled with smoke because of everything falling off the walls. We might have seen that. We just wouldn't have known that it was at the voice of them that had called. One additional element here, that after in verse 5, Isaiah exclaims, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of defiled lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of defiled lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the God of hosts. Verse 6, Then flew unto me one of the seraphim, with a glowing stone in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. Again we ask, what would we have seen? We might have seen, perhaps as a result of the earthquake and the altar shaking, that a glowing stone flew off of the altar and smacked the prophet in the mouth. We might have seen the flying glowing stone. Just we wouldn't have seen that it, it was flying because one of the seraphim had taken it with tongues from off the altar. When in verse 7 we read, he touched my mouth with it. We could all have seen the stone hit Isaiah in the mouth. But we wouldn't have understood that it was because of one of the seraphim touching Isaiah's mouth and saying, lo, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin atoned for. That we couldn't have known without being prophets. But the description, the narrative, what the prophet is seeing, we might well have seen as well the external reality, not the inner meaning. The prophet isn't cut off from the outside world. On the contrary, the prophet may be seeing everything that we as external non-prophetic observers are seeing as well. He sees more, not less. He understands what's taking place on an immeasurably deeper plane. He understands the earth is quaking because of those that called. He understands everything so much more deeply. So, of course, inevitably, returning to the story of Genesis chapter 18, what exactly the prophet Abraham is seeing taking place in Sodom? chapters 18 and 19, he could be seeing exactly the same as the folks in Sodom's city, the city overturned, and even Lot getting out of town. He understands that it's all taking place because of angels sent by God. They don't. But the cities are overthrown, and Lot is saved. Abraham understands it so much more deeply. Now again, I'm going to reiterate, this is one way of our understanding the whole narrative of chapter 18, and in particular, how to understand chapter 18, verse 1. We'll still need to return to this first possibility. We'll do so toward the end today. But, you know, while certainly this possibility gives us a very deep message in our understanding how prophecy operates and what may indeed be described in these verses, I'm sure it doesn't surprise you that many Bible scholars regard this interpretation as too much of a stretch. Too implausible to say that everything taking place, again, 
from chapter 18, verse 2, through chapter 19, verse 26, is all sandwiched between God appeared to Abraham, and then Abraham got up in the morning. So, of course, inevitably, we need to consider another possibility. We still have the same problem. Again, chapter 18, verse 1, God appeared to Abraham, seems to be a dangling verse. Well, as we noted, either we connect it with what comes afterward, which is what we just discussed, or we connect it with what came before. And what indeed came before. We already noted this. Let's just review very briefly. At the end of chapter 17, we read of Abraham's circumcision. And of course, in reading of this circumcision, we understand we're not reading about some mere minor procedure. Nothing is a minor procedure when one is 99 years old, as Abraham is. In chapter 17, verse 24, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the same day was Abraham circumcised, and Ishmael his son, and so on. And of course, again, as we already noted, since Abraham is the subject of these verses, the last verse of chapter 17, and all the men of his house, whose house? Abraham's house, were circumcised with him. With whom? With Abraham. We understand that when we get to verse 1, and God appeared unto him, unto him is unto Abraham. Well, that was already obvious. But we still have that problem. What was God appearing to Abraham? To communicate. We don't read the content of the prophecy. We consider the possibility that maybe the content of the prophecy is what takes place from verse 2 and on. But now we consider another alternative. We understand verse 1 as connected with the end of chapter 17. Why is God appearing to Abraham? Because God teaches Abraham and us a lesson about bestowing kindness on others. You know, one of the archetypal expressions of kindness is visiting the ill. A 99-year-old man who just underwent surgery definitely qualifies. So in this interpretation, in chapter 18, verse 1, God is coming to pay a sick visit to Abraham, who was convalescing from his surgery, teaching again Abraham and all of us a lesson about kindness. So we don't need to read any particular content of God appearing to Abraham because it was simply to appear there. When you go to visit someone who is ill, you're not going to tell him something. You're not going to get into some profound discussion. You're going to express your sympathy. You're going just to be there. Even if it's just being there and sitting there quietly. His knowing that you're there makes all the difference. So if that's the purpose of God's revelation to Abraham, we don't need to read any content. The content is just being there. The problem, of course, with this interpretation is we still have to deal with chapter 18, verse 2, and everything that happens afterward. And he lifted up his eyes and saw... And lo, three men stood over against him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed down to the earth. Well, what has verse 1 to do with verse 2? In our first possibility, we understood very well. God appearing to Abraham is the introduction to what we read in verse 2. And in this possibility, what connection is there between verse 1 and verse 2? The answer is directly. Absolutely nothing. On the contrary, Abraham 
who of course doesn't know that these are angels, sees three strangers walking down the road. Now, God has just appeared to Abraham. And how does Abraham relate to this set of circumstances? Well, now we get to consider the profound ambiguity of verse 3. And why indeed the text encapsulates such ambiguity that in translation, unfortunately, gets lost. Because what Abraham says in verse 3 is obviously addressed to somebody. In the Hebrew, the word that we read is Adonai, which can be a name of God. And it could also mean, literally, my lords. My lords, with the realization that sometimes the plural is used as an expression of respect, my lord. My lord, not referring to God, but perhaps referring to one of maybe even all three of the people who are coming down the road. Well, in the first possibility that we considered, in verse 3, we're obviously going to have to understand this word as addressed to one of or all of the strangers coming down the road. That is, my Lord, in a mundane sense, not talking to God, because Abraham isn't talking to God here. Abraham is talking to the strangers coming down the road. So, my Lord, if I found favor in your sight, and again, your sight is going to be addressed to these strangers. Pass not away, I pray you, from your servant. I'll fix you a meal. That was in the first possibility that we discussed. But now we're discussing another possibility. And the other possibility, God has appeared to Abraham. Immediately afterward, after this sick visit begins, Abraham sees the strangers coming down the road. And he has a problem, of course. Where should his priorities lie? And he says to God, my Lord, in translation will say, with a capital L, if now I have found favor in your sight, God, pass not away, I pray you, from your servant. That is, God, I know you've just come to reveal yourself to me, to do this act of kindness, paying this sick visit to me, and it's very nice of you, but um, with all due respect, I have something more important to do than sit around talking to you. I see three strangers coming down the road. I have to welcome them to, into my house. Now, lest we think that Abraham is being awfully rude to God here, not just rude, it even seems heretical. God comes to appear to you? And you say, sorry, God, I have more important things to do than talking to you. I'm running to these strangers. In fact, what Abraham is demonstrating, not just to God, to us, is he is truly a godly man. God had come to Abraham teaching him this message of how great it is to bestow kindness on a human being. God visiting the sick, and Abraham is, in effect, saying to God, I got the message. I got the message so well, I'm going to bestow kindness on a fellow human being, on these wayfarers, because, of course, another major category of kindness is hospitality, welcoming strangers into your home. And 
my proactively doing this kindness is so much more important than my being on the receiving end of your kindness. We have an ancient saying in our tradition based upon this verse. It is greater to welcome strangers, to welcome guests into your home than to receive God's presence. You're showing your godliness. Not by welcoming God's presence. God wants us to focus our attention on his creatures rather than on him. That's not rudeness. Certainly it's not heresy. On the contrary, it is demonstrating the extent to which we learned the lesson well. We got the message. Becoming godly means becoming more and more considerate of our fellow human beings. All of them, God's creatures. And indeed, this is a message that we observe not only in this act on the part of Abraham. Consider also what we read further on in chapter 18. Beginning in verse 23, we read of an extraordinary attempt at, what shall we call this, bargaining? Between Abraham and God. Abraham challenges God. From verse 23 and on, Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep away and not forgive the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That'd be far from you to do like this. Maybe a better translation would be, God forbid you should do such a thing. To slay the righteous with the wicked, that so the righteous should be as the wicked? That'd be far from you. God forbid you should do such a thing. Shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? And of course, again, we're liable to think, what a disrespectful Abraham. How rude, even, heretical, to speak to God like this. But no, if we thought that, we would be wrong again. Because, of course, we see God doesn't rebuke Abraham. God considers it appropriate to respond to each of Abraham's challenges. Verse 26, God said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will forgive all the place for their sake. I accept. And then Abraham continues, peradventure there shall lack five of the 50 righteous. Will you destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it. If I find there 45. And they continue, Abraham asking about 40. I will not do it for the 40's sake. Peradventure there shall be 30. I will not do it if I find 30 there. Peradventure there shall be 20 found there. I will not destroy it for the 20's sake. Peradventure 10 shall be found there. I will not destroy it for the 10's sake. There's no rebuke here at all. Abraham is doing exactly what God wanted him to do. But now, when we consider the implications, and we've noted this, but it, it's so crucial for us to emphasize the point here. We note this again. Many people think that to be religious means to be simply completely subservient to God, to not have any sense of right and wrong, to just follow God's instructions, and that's it. I suspect many religious people also do. They think that good and evil is just obediently following what God dictates. It should be clear, when we consider what Abraham is saying to God in this passage, that Abraham, the Torah, God's word, categorically rejects that approach. Because after all, if 
the definition of what is good, what is right, what is just, were simply what God does, then the challenge, shall not the judge of all the earth do justly, could not possibly begin. Because then whatever God does is just. God defines justice. So of course what he does is doing justly. That's not what Abraham says. What, in effect, Abraham is saying is, I have in my mind, in my heart, a sense of what is justice. God, I am holding you to that. I'm challenging you. Because if you slay the wicked and the righteous together, then you are violating the code of what justice is, as I understand it. Now, of course, we do realize, don't we, that we have within ourselves that sense of justice precisely because God created us with it. We're not denying that. But it still operates autonomously. We have that sense. We resonate with what is just. We're not simply subserviently following God's dictates. We take the initiative. Abraham personifies taking the initiative. Even to the extent that when God is ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham takes the initiative and he says, I'm not letting you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? The way Abraham relates to people, to all people, be they anonymous strangers coming down the road whom he never met before and will never see again, be they the people of Sodom and Gomorrah whom he doesn't know and on top of it all are renowned for their wickedness, the way he relates to people is with concern, with compassion. The focus of his attention much more than it seems God is the focus of his attention. But that's precisely because Abraham is truly godly. And to be truly godly means to be concerned about God's creatures more than being concerned about God. Now, of course, inevitably, recall in this vein what we noted at the outset, the difference between Abraham and Noah. Noah walked with God. Chapter 6, verse 9. God says to Abraham, my covenant with you is based upon my summons, chapter 17, verse 1, to walk before me. What makes you, Abraham, is you take the initiative. You're not just following my lead. You're walking before. It's ironic to note that in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 9, we read an extraordinary reference to the flood, the waters of Noah. Can't help but consider. You know, many people like to have their name associated with something for all time. The plaque, so-and-so. Well, where does Noah have his plaque emblazoned on the flood, the waters of Noah. Doesn't sound like a very pleasant thing to have one's name associated with for all time, the waters of Noah. And indeed in our tradition, this is a rebuke. Because when God says to Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham argues. When God says to Noah, I'm bringing a flood to destroy the world, Noah doesn't. Okay, God, you're the boss, whatever you say. God doesn't want people to say whatever you say. God doesn't want someone to say, I'll just focus upon God and forget about God's creatures. If you're godly, 
you'll focus on God's creatures. Noah didn't. The flood becomes the waters of Noah. Because in some sense, he gets faulted for them. If he would have had more compassion, he would have prayed on behalf of his contemporaries. Maybe he would have actively tried to reform their ways. He didn't. Ironically, he was perhaps too focused upon God to be truly godly. Abraham is the one who focuses upon being godly by not focusing upon God, by focusing upon God's creatures. And perhaps by way of conclusion, we should note that this is precisely the message that we get really when, when you consider both possibilities in interpreting the opening of Genesis chapter 18. That is, once again, we'll emphasize in the second possibility, well, obviously, if Abraham is prepared to say to God, God, I'm putting you on hold. I'm focusing upon these strangers rather than experiencing prophecy from you. Again, as our tradition expresses it, teaching us the lesson, it is greater to welcome strangers, to welcome guests, than to receive God's presence. Obviously, in this second possibility, the message is all about learning to be godly by focusing upon doing acts of kindness, by paying attention to God's creatures, not to God. But you know, when we consider once again the first possibility, again, the first possibility that chapter 18, verse 1 is a title, and from verse 2 and on, we are reading a detailed description of everything that's taking place in Abraham's, or perhaps Abraham's and Sarah's prophetic vision. The obvious glaring question is, there seems to be an awful lot of extraneous detail how Abraham and Sarah are preparing this feast for these strangers, but they're not preparing a feast. It's all happening in their minds. It's not an actual external reality. So why bother telling us about any of this? What difference does it make? Why all the detail? But you know, when we consider what's taking place in the story, there's a profound message in all of this detail. Even if we posit it's only taking place in the prophetic vision of Abraham and Sarah. All the detail. Because, you know, when we get to chapter 18, verse 10, as we noted, we read about an extraordinary miracle taking place. I will certainly return unto you when the season comes round, and lo, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son, a 99-year-old husband and an 89-year-old wife, married for many decades, completely childless. And the promise, when he's 100 and she's 90, they'll have a son. An extraordinary miracle like this doesn't happen for everyone. The merit, being the recipient, such an extraordinary miracle, you really have to be godly. Had it Abraham and Sarah become the godly man and godly woman that they did to merit such an extraordinary miracle? It's all part of, he took the curd and the milk and the calf, which he addressed and set it before them. And Sarah's baking the cakes and everything else. Kindness. This is the path to godliness. This was what made them worthy of this miracle. And implicitly then, in this interpretation, even if the entire narrative is happening in their minds, in the prophetic vision, it's important to know about it. To know 
that an extraordinary miracle like this that happens because you've become so close to God happens because you've become a person who is an embodiment of kindness for God's creatures. God reveals himself to us more than everything else as the giver, giving us everything. We become godly by becoming givers ourselves. And so, really, the conclusion that emerges from the first possibility is the same as the conclusion that emerges from the second possibility. This is the path to godliness. And indeed, on this note, we can conclude, that's precisely the note with which God so stresses what makes Abraham, Abraham. The verses that immediately precede Abraham's bargaining with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that immediately follow the verses that describe Abraham and Sarah being the godly dispensers of kindness in this world. In verse 17 and on, in chapter 18, God said, shall I hide from Abraham that which I am doing, seeing that Abraham surely shall become a great and mighty nation and all the nations shall be blessed in him? For I have known him to the end that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of God to do righteousness and justice, to the end that God may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. What makes Abraham Abraham? That he commands his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of God. What is the way of God? It's not focusing on God. It's doing righteousness and justice. It's appreciating that the real barometer of being godly is being godly in this world. Spirituality that's otherworldly spirituality will always be suspect of being counterfeit spirituality. To be godly means to focus on God's creatures. Abraham, not Noah, becomes the first of our patriarchs, as Sarah becomes the first of our matriarchs. We're all descended, of course, from Noah, but Noah didn't teach us this lesson, not as Abraham did. Noah, in his own way, was a righteous man. He went with God. But going with God isn't enough to actually become godly. Abraham and Sarah are godly because they're not going with God. They're going first. Before, go before me. Going before me and focusing much more on my creatures than on me. Because in order to truly become godly, in order to become the worthy beneficiary of God's blessings, we need more than anything else to learn to bless others. It is by blessing others that we become blessed. It is by focusing upon God's creatures, not God, that we become godly and merit God's blessings. God bless you.